how are you? I'm doing fine. Um, who you got with you today? Oh, we got a uh, uh, Sam Pickleman. He's a member here at Concordia Lutheran. I just graduated, right? That's right, yeah. That's so. And what's your plan? Moving down to Florida, working for a Christian uh, news organization here in two weeks. So I'm very excited to be doing that. Really? What's the name of the organization? Uh, Truth and Life Media Production. And we do a, cross, um, a show called Crosstalk News and production for a couple other uh, big shows. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. excited. Crosstalk News. I'll have to check that out. And yeah, when I get down there, I'm, uh, I'm doing a debate on the Eucharist with a non denom Protestant. Okay. So it'll be fun. No, that, and that's good. That gets us right to why is Sam with us? Because we're going to answer the question, hopefully uh, answer the question or at least talk about the question. What does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? And uh, so we were having conversations with Sam about this this week or starting to have conversations. And uh, Pastor Mapis said, what if Sam joined us on this? And I thought, well, I don't have a good reason not to. In fact, I think it's a great idea. So um, if you want to be a special guest on <laughs> what does the Bible say about series? Let us know. Maybe we'll bring you in and uh, uh, we'll see how this goes. Maybe we should see how it goes before we invite others to join us. <laughs> you know, there's a large waiting list. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there will be after this. So, yeah. all right, well, let's jump into it. We are looking to see what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper. And um, probably the best place to start is where the Lord's Supper begins, uh, unless you want to start somewhere else. Um Maybe we could start chronologically in John chapter six, uh, but that's that's um, going to take us down a rabbit trail that we'll get to maybe later. But um, uh, John chapter six, because Jesus mentions uh, communion esque language there. But uh, the the Lord's Supper actually begins in on the night when Jesus was betrayed in that upper room, the thir Monday Thursday, as we call it in the church year observations. Um, so they had the. Uh, um, the Lord's Supper there for the first time and, and Jesus instituted it with his words. And um, we uh, we speak those words in, in our church when we when we have communion and we. Um, so. So, yeah, that's that's probably the, the clearest, maybe um, saying from the Bible about the Lord's Supper. Right. Yeah. And I was just talking to Sam about this earlier that, uh, you know, we, we start with the Gospels when it comes to the Lord's Supper. And the genre of those texts, they're historical narratives. So the, they're written history, divine history. Uh, so we, we kind of take Jesus at his word here. Well, when he, what he says is this is what he means. It's, I've heard it spoken of it. This is his last will and testament. Right. Uh, so Jesus is not playing around with metaphoric words or figurative language. He's, he's actually speaking what he means. Right. And what he wants the disciples actually to believe and, and receive as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and that's and that's good uh, whenever we're approaching uh, studying scripture is to know what what type of literature is being talked about there. So this isn't a poetic um, portion of scripture that you might find in the Psalms or some of the, the writings. This is uh, narrative history. And so so when we get Jesus is saying his words that. Um, um, so Matthew 26, um, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And um, remind me, I should have looked at this. This is a very rudimentary thing. It's, it shows up in, in three of the four gospels. Um, isn't it Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Yes, yeah. And then, um, and all those words also show up in in uh, First Corinthians. Um, so we have those words of Jesus are very similar uh, words of Jesus recorded from that night when the Lord's Supper was instituted, recorded four places in Scripture. Which is one of the things that, um, not to get too into the weeds with this, but one of the things that we look for when. Um, developing or having doctrines of our faith or, or teachings of the Christian faith is that it's uh, repeated things that scripture says. It's not just a one-off uh, statement. Um, and when, when we have a one-off statement in scripture, we're, we don't doubt its veracity or, or, or doubt its, um, its truthfulness, but we, we don't necessarily make it a huge part of our life. But since the Lord's Supper is mentioned four times, and then it's 
uh, referenced uh, a number of times in the epistles as something that the, the church was participating in. And in the book of Acts, we, we've we made it a part of our, our life with God. No, I just even to that, you, you mentioned the four Gospels and, and particularly uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There, when you, if you read the account there, when Paul talks, uh, gives the account, this is the Lord, what I received from the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I betrayed, and took bread. That's actually closer. That's kind of a compilation of all what the gospel say. It's what we use in our hymnals and our words of institution. Right. That the church has used uh, for the last 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. But you can see from Paul's aspect of it, what he received from the Lord is what he took from the four gospels. And Paul didn't interpret it with any figurative language, too. He kept the language as it's literally was spoken by Christ himself. Right. And put it into practice, which gives further testimony that Paul took these words as as the literal understanding. This is my body. This is my blood. Take and eat for the forgiveness of your sins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and so so, so we're getting right to the crux of the uh, the Lutheran debate and the reform debate here with um, what is the Lord's Supper? And, and I think the Bible is clear. Uh, what what is happening in the Lord's Supper? So, like you said, it's it's Paul doesn't take it as figurative language, and we don't interpret the the Gospels as figurative language. But that that is um, that is to say, and it's an important thing to realize because there are are some uh, Christian uh, faiths out there, Christian traditions out there, who take it as figurative language. And it's it's one of those things that that comes up when when you're talking about the Lord's Supper. So so to be explicit about it, we literally believe that when we're communing at the Lord's altar, we receive the body of Christ. That is the flesh of Christ. And we receive the blood of Christ um, when, when we drink the wine. Now, it's still bread. It's still wine. But Jesus said, this is my body. And he said, this is my blood. So we don't try to explain it. We just thank God that we can believe it. And, and that's really, for me, the crux of the debate is is that this is a faith thing. This isn't a reason thing. This isn't a, a science thing, if you will. This is this is taking Jesus at his word and, and letting it be truth that we, we don't have to explain. We only get to believe. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, I like the idea you took about this as a faith, faith issue, uh, taking the word of God at its face value. Because when Luther talks about this in the Lord's Supper or in the Catechism, what makes one worthy to receive? Do you believe these words given and shed you for the forgiveness of sins? And also what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 10, do you discern the body blood of Christ? Mm -hmm. Or does the particip participation in the blood of Christ? Right. So you have you have these are all faith issues of just taking the word of God as it is written. Right. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And and what, as I was thinking about this today, I was thinking about how um different traditions of Christianity will take that um, that figurative um, we see the um, the effects of taking Jesus words figuratively in the Lord's Supper show up in other places of their uh, their doctrine so for example when we believe that uh, when we come to faith we believe that it's the work of the Holy Spirit that that gives us faith to believe and to confess we don't think it's it's not an argumentative it's not an apologetics it's not an intellectual assent it's not like you're you've now taught somebody enough now they're going to agree with you because of what they know we we attribute all the the work of faith and in, in bringing someone to a, a conversion if you will use that term um to the holy spirit it's the work of the holy spirit it's the work of god who creates that faith in us whereas in, if i i might be wrong in this but i i think from what i understand i think a lot of people who take a figurative view of the lord's supper have a different understanding of how someone comes to faith that it's more of an intellectual ascent and it's and it's more on the the onus or the responsibility of the the non-believer to to give up so to speak or to um to to assent to agree or to ask god into their hearts and so it's kind of an interesting thing because <laughs> For me, it's a beautiful thing. I've been Lutheran my whole life, and I've I've never struggled with my um the my faith that Jesus' words can be what they say, even if they don't make sense to me. But I can see that struggle when when you grow up in a faith tradition that that so much of the responsibility of faith is 
put into the mind or the, the life of a believer to either ask God into his heart through a prayer or to um, to have a, a, a knowledge experience to make it a, a faith moment that that it it just makes sense then for them to to be more comfortable with uh, having a reasonable um, that is a, an explainable understanding of what's going on in the Lord's Supper. And, and I think it's just safest for us to say we can't explain how this bread, this wine, his body, his blood. It just is what it is. That's what Jesus says. You know, I didn't think about the, the I have, but you've really brought it to a different level, understanding the intellectual uh, aspect of this with people trying to figure out how and the why mm -hmm. behind taking it as the literal blood of, and body of Christ. Hey, I was just talking to Sam earlier before we uh, started talking about our, our podcast here. You know, I was talking about about the with Moses and the burning bush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, that same aspect. You have you have the Lord in the burning. You have in the within and under the burning bush. You have the tree. You have fire. You have the Lord speaking. The the tree's not consumed. The Lord is there. There's fire. Uh, how how can that be? Right. Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and for us Lutherans and, and people of, of faith, it's okay for us to say, "I just can't, I can't explain it." It's like right. trying to explain the Trinity itself. You know, we can come up with some analogies, but they always fall short mm -hmm. to the the full breadth and understanding of of what's beyond our concept or our intellectual understanding of what's taking place. Right. With that, and I think that's what happens with uh, with many people is how can this be the body and blood of Christ? Yet I'm still tasting bread and wine. Right. And I think for us Lutherans, it's okay to say, I, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Sam. Well, one of the main arguments that he kept giving me was that Jesus talks in symbolism. Like when he said that we're born again, we don't literally come out of the womb again. But like you said, it's not just about changing your intellectual thoughts. It is something much more than that. And when I'm eating communion, when I'm taking communion, yes, I'm not actually taking a bite out of Jesus's arm. But it's not just bread and wine. It's something more than that. God is present in that, just as he is in your conversion. Yeah. Just as he is in your conversion. It's not just, like I said, a change of thoughts. Right. No, exactly. And I, and I was thinking, too, one of the verses that came to mind um, when I was thinking along these lines was uh, when Jesus says at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I, I think a lot of times we have a, a kind of a nebulous understanding of what that is, that, oh, Jesus is present everywhere so of course he's with us you know he's in this room with me now so he's with me and and that's well and good but i i i thought you know maybe maybe it's it's jesus is saying something more concrete than that he's saying i'm with you always look <laughs> i'm present in the lord's supper for you guys like i said this is my body this is my blood and that's i think a powerful way to to think about jesus presence his real presence <laughs> concretely and and to take that not to to say when Jesus says, I am with you always, it doesn't mean he's with us on Monday morning when we're um, doing the dishes or whatever it might be. He is with us in, in all those circumstances, but he's he's actually showing up um, both in the Lord's Supper and then not to get too far into a, a, another conversation, but also in baptism. When 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 we're clothed and when we're recalling our baptism, the scriptures talking about us being clothed with Christ, buried with Christ, um, hidden with Christ. And and that's that's the real presence of Christ with us in in a concrete way that we can draw ourselves back to. I am baptized, so I know I have Jesus with me. Um, he said he's going to be here in this meal, so I know he's with me here in these places. And um, and then he can, of course, take it to the third means of grace. If, if you want to talk that way, uh, we understand the means of grace is places where God's grace comes to us. And, and that's wherever the word of God is found. And, and especially specifically the forgiveness of sins. And, and we know he's with us in those moments. No, I, I like what you talk about where he's concretely uh, expressed himself to be. And we would also say that, to add to that, that it's where he promised to be. Right. It's where he's promised to be. Now, just to kind of get back to some of the, the non-Lutheran folks that don't, particularly on the evangelical side of the ledger, uh, the reason why they really have a hard time, this kind of gets more a little bit more of a heavy dogmatic understanding of it, but they really have a deficiency in understanding the two natures of Christ itself. You know, they, they don't have a, they're very deficient, especially with understanding Christ's divinity, mm -hmm. that he is fully God and man. 
and that he can he can be seated at the right hand of the Father and still be at every altar where bread and wine is consecrated. Mm. He can do that because he is God and man. Yeah. At, uh, at one of the great things I was telling Sam earlier too, I believe it's Calvin and his institutes when he's concerning Jesus in the upper room. Uh, he couldn't figure out. He said that, you know, Jesus passes through a door, eats a piece of fish, shows him his scars and his flesh and everything and from the from the crucifixion. And then he disappears. Well, Calvin, and because he had such a, a deficiency with his view of the divinity of Christ, he made the comment that Jesus must have escaped through a trap door. Mm. But because he could not bring himself to fully understand uh, what Christ was capable of in his attributes of being fully God and fully man. Right. Someone who could sleep and get tired, but yet stop the seas from roaring and the waves and, and speak and people could raise from the dead. People are healed. Uh, he, they could, he could not bring himself to fully understand that. Right. No. And I, and I think that's uh further evidence of, of one of the roots of this problem is, is the, the, the air of rationalism to think that to think that everything has to be explained and and once you open that door and you say well everything that god does has to be explainable i mean you go all the way back to creation and it allows um questions about god's creative performative word in creating the world it it goes to all of jesus's miracles you know did he really um make five loaves and two fish into a meal for five thousand or was there just a uh an in inspiration of generosity from that young boy that allowed everybody else to share what they had on on scene you know all sorts of questions doubts start to enter the scene and say did jesus just walk on water did he just know where the shallow points were you know all these things and, and then ultimately like did jesus really rise from the dead or is that just a a feel-good thought that the disciples um comforted themselves with and, and all of a sudden your entire basis of your christian faith is is on the rails because you're trying to rationally explain everything. And, and I think this, this conversation about the Lord's Supper is a really important one to get people to wrestle with because when, when they take Jesus at his word, it really puts you on a solid footing for taking all of the fantastic. And I, I say that because it's close to the word fantasy. Cause I think a lot of times people will, will say, Oh, well, you're just making a, a fantasy out of these things or a, a mythology that um, casting doubt on it, causing some, um, a disagreement with with the truth that we take scripture to be and so this just goes back to just letting god's word be god's word and we're, we're warned about this in genesis when when adam and eve eat the apple they gain knowledge they 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 are they then learn to question everything that is around them instead of accepting what it is what it is for what it is being satisfied with god's word yeah no very good point and i think that's a uh, exactly because i mean yeah we got to draw it all back to the fall into sin where this corruption of our mind came from and and that was a great diagnosis or not diagnosis but a great uh assessment that the lord put out that you you will uh, uh their their eyes were opened and and this was just when when um this rational mind started to rebel against the creator no it's uh kind of because we can get into all the grammatical things you know this is mean is and, and things like that but i think in most people who who study grammar particularly greek grammar and just english grammar would understand it this that's just plain simple literal language yeah I, I, I don't, you know I, we could get into that but i don't think it's really necessary because the text speaks for itself but what i was going to ask you how do you uh but now having the, the understanding that we have concerning the Lord's Supper and maybe those who don't have maybe they you know because we I, I always kind of liken it this way our understanding of the Lord's Supper is pure gospel those who on the evangelical side of things they see it as law do this in remembrance of me there's nothing gospel about their understanding now there's a little bit with some of the Calvinists will will see that for forgiveness of sins but many of them just see this as a remembrance meal mm -hmm. Which is really law. Yeah, it's the same way they take baptism. The same with all the sacraments. It, it's it's law. We take it as gospel. But now having understand that, you can see now what we when to move into the issue of closed communion or how we understand closed communion, how we guard 
I guess, in the lack of better terms, how we guard the rail in a sense to keep people from partaking unworthily. Where would you go off or where would you start with that? Right. Well, b before we go to that, maybe we'll, I want to talk a little bit about that remembrance word, because I think that is part of the um, argument that individuals will make against or, or uh, different faith traditions will make about um, the Lord's Supper being just a memorial meal. It's a it's a meal that we do that enacts something that that took place in the past. And and I, I I'm not too familiar with their um their teachings on it, but I would I would assume that they might even say, well, yeah, maybe at that first meal it was Jesus' flesh and blood for those disciples. But but now we get to react that meal, and so we remember it with our bread and wine understanding this miracle took place back then I, i'm i'm making an argument that i can understand people might jump to that conclusion but but i i think there's there's powerful powerful meaning behind that word remembrance that sometimes gets lost in translation and and one of my favorite places to show what the word remember does in scripture when god remembers something it's it's not just an intellectual activity when god remembers something he actually acts and so one of my favorite places is, as I, I think it's Genesis 8, verse 1, when it says, um, God remembered Noah and his family. And, right. at, and at that point in the, the flood story, and, it, and the way the story's outlined is really cool. It's kind of like a, uh, it's a very much a chiastic structure where the very center point of the story is that verse when Jesus, when, when, when Moses records, God remembered Noah and his family. And, and what God does, God doesn't just say, oh, yeah, I have some people on a boat down there. No, at that point, the story turns and the water starts, to, the, the rain stop, the floods recede, and, and, and there's salvation that, that comes. God didn't let them be destroyed. He actually acted in his remembrance. And I, and I think that's part of what Jesus is saying in the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me, that, that this is an action that, that we do in the remembrance. It's not just an intellectual recalling or a memorializing of something that Jesus did in the past, but it's actually Jesus doing again for us. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up because at seminary, in my gospels class with Dr. Weinrich, small we had, we had our small boot, small group session, and uh, at the second half of the week with him, and he brought up he brought up that very same thing. And when you and remember to me, in a sense, is really God remembering you, mm -hmm. what you just said with like with the flood there, uh, and the Greek can almost allow that. Yeah, uh, with that, and so in the sense of it's not us remembering him but we come to the supper he is remembering us right yeah 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 and so you were getting down the the track then of why do we uh guard the rail what is the purpose of closed communion um as we we call it in our circles here we we practice closed communion um and and the reason we do that like you said is so that we can prevent people from coming and if you stop listening at that point we sound like jerks i'll <laughs> sanitize to myself there um but but really what we're we're doing is we're protecting people from getting into something that could harm them because scripture is quite clear that that if you don't eat and drink without examining yourself without discerning the body and blood of christ then you're eating and drinking damnation upon yourself and so we want to prevent that from happening to people um so that's part of the reason for closed communion but the other aspect of it, that's that's the, the vertical relationship. We really want to make sure we're approaching God rightly. But the horizontal relationship, there's there's two aspects, two reasons we do close communion is because when we come to the altar and when you're um, kneeling at the altar next to some sinner next to you, you're saying, I'm a sinner like them. And and we we confess and we we desire forgiveness, but but you're saying I I believe what they believe. And so it's not just a belief in the Lord's Supper that's important when you're coming to the rail. But you're also making a confession to the world and, and to those at least who can see you're going to communion that you are in agreement with these people. And so, so you don't want to have differences of opinion about things like women's ordination or the creation of the world. You know, those doctrinal differences um, are, are divisions among us. And, and Paul's quite clear in, in Corinthians. He says, let there be no divisions among you. And, and for a long time, I, I took that to be, well, don't be divided, just everybody be together let's just be united it, even with our differences don't let them divide you but but really what it means is is and and how i take it as a pastor is that when i'm communing somebody 
I'm I'm understanding that they have the same confession as everybody and as me that that we believe scripture is what it is and says what it says and, and there's no divisions among us. We, we're not going to have communion and then go argue about creation and evolution. We're not going to have communion and go argue about um, the the sanctity of life. We're we're in the in this together and it's a confession that way. So so for me that's those those two um, ropes that we have that we we want to walk across carefully. Uh, when we're guarding the rail, as you said it. Now, it, uh, it gets to what Paul talks about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, in 16, he talks about the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? But this is the reason why I came here, verse 17. Because there is one bread, we are many, our one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And what I think what Paul is getting at here is we are of one, that one loaf, that one mind. Mm -hmm. As you talked about, make it's the public confession of what we believe, teach, and confess. Right. As we come to the rail together. I also wanted to mention something else, too. Uh, Luther would talk about in the large catechism about there's three things that, you know, to, to prepare somebody for the Lord's Supper. What is it? Uh what are the benefits and three who is partake of it and, and those three things that that really once you we examine people to teach them to examine themselves based off those three questions with that yeah and so yeah so what is it what's the body blood of christ for forgiveness of your sins what are the benefits of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life and and who is to be prepared who who's received this it's those who can discern it's the body and blood of Christ and also examine themselves to uh, to see if they're worthy. Now, here's a question for you. What makes one worthy? Yeah. I mean, you kind of said it, but. Yeah, Jesus makes us worthy, right? <laughs> right. Jesus is always the right answer. So we'll start there. But no. Yeah. So to, uh, I'm, and you're asking me to recall my catechism knowledge, but but uh, even just going off the top of my head it's it's when you understand that you're a sinner in need of what the gifts are given there bring and and that's 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 what makes you worthy is is knowing that you're not worthy yeah really. exactly well what, what a great paradoxical understanding of but is it i mean it's it's how we understand the supper is uh what makes you worthy of realizing you're not worthy yeah you're you're a prime candidate for the supper yeah yeah, and I, and I I think too I've I've been thinking a lot about the word disciple this this uh, past week now um, past couple of days at this point but the uh, um, the the word disciple um, it's kind of the the key word for our school year theme here at Trinity where because um, we're pulling from um, the Great Commission go and make disciples of all nations and and um, how does that happen teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Um, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And I've, I've said it before, I think in these, uh, these, the series that, that Jesus doesn't just command us, um, willy nilly. The things that Jesus commands are, are really quite simple. Um, he tells us to love our neighbors. He tells us to pray. Um, but then he tells us to, uh, baptize that's right there in the great commission. And he also tells us to uh, take and eat and take and drink. And so I, if, if I'm recalling correctly, I used to say he just tells us to baptize and tells us to uh, do the Lord's Supper, tells us to love. But then I remember, oh, yeah, he also tells us to pray. Uh, but I think those are really the only four things that, that Jesus gives us to do. And if you stand back and look at, at what the life of the church is, we're just living the commands of Jesus and and following his example and and doing what he says to do. So so to get that back to what you were saying is um, who's worthy receiving? Well, it's someone who, who wants to follow Jesus, is following Jesus, is a disciple of Jesus and is doing what he's commanded. And I almost brought that train of thought up when you said that um, there's others that make the Lord's Supper into a law. And, and I was going to push you a little bit because I, I do feel like at, at some on some levels, uh, for perhaps a big level, we do the Lord's Supper because we're told to do it, which is a law. Um, and, and we do baptism because we're told to do it, which is a law. In our, our last session, we talked about prayer. We do pray. Um, I, I brought up the point we pray primarily because God tells us to pray. It's, it's honoring his name. 
Um, and, and of course, we love our neighbors because that's what we're told to do. But especially with the Lord's Supper and with uh, baptism, we don't do those things only for um, for the sake of carrying out what God said. But those things come, like you said, attached with a promise. They have gifts given in those moments. So it's it's not a one sided action. It's it's something that in some ways opens the door for God to step in and give us what we need. No, it's uh, thanks for that clarification, because it is uh, he does command us to do these things. But the difference is, is what we receive from them. Right. You know, once we, if we try to follow God's commands and try to merit his uh, our salvation before him with those things, we're going to fail miserably. And we're all going to fall short. We all do. And we're going to receive nothing but temporal and eternal punishment because of those things. Mm -hmm. But it's different with these commands. It's, it's uh, could you almost call it a gospel imperative? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, with the sacraments, I mean, it's a, we are commanded to do these things, but they're they're gospel saturated, but they're commands that we receive. Oh, yeah. you know, it's not in our doing, but really in our receiving. Yeah, no, and it, it, it just got me thinking. It's like. Well, we, we tell people to go to church, but it's not because we want them to suffer through a boring sermon that I'm preaching. We, we don't want them to, to sing through hymns they've never heard before and can't even follow the tune on us. That's not, we're not sitting there trying to make their life miserable as some people assume it to be, but, but this is where God's promised to show up for us. And, and again, back to that uh, statement, I'm with you always, not that he's not everywhere, but there's specific places uh, that he's promised to be for us. And and so you can go there and not doubt that God is where he's said he's going to be in those moments and doing the things he's said he's going to do in those places. But just think about the witness of the church itself throughout the the, the, the centuries, going clear back to the, the first century, you know, between all the trials and tribulations, plagues, wars, and rumors of wars, uh, even wars during our times when chaplains are going out into monk soldiers What's, you know, they, yeah, they might say devotion and things, but it's the one thing that, that he, that they bring to the people is, is the Holy Supper. Right. It's something that it's, it's the one thing people crave. It's one thing Christians crave. When the greatest trial in the times of the trials and, and, and needs that they find themselves in, it's the one thing that they really, truly ask for is the Holy Supper. And it's been that way since the dawn of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a long, long tradition. And um, I, was, I was just going to point out that the other major uh, faith traditions or denominations, whatever you want to call them, that hold to a real presence. Um, um, we got the Catholic faith, which until the Reformation was the faith, and they, they believed that it was Christ's body and blood. Um, and then Martin Luther said, well, maybe not everything the church is doing is great. Maybe we can fix those things. And they said, no, you're out of here. And then, um, I mean, this just kind of Reformation history with my minuscule understanding of it. There are some people that said, oh, yeah, everything the Catholic Church does is bad. And so it's, the pendulum swang too far. And, and us Lutherans tried to hang the middle. Um, the Episcopal Church also um, kind of hung the middle a little bit. And they they also believe that this is... Christ's true body and blood for us but yeah we see it's it's a historical tenet of the faith uh, to believe not just that it is Christ's body and blood but it is actually God doing the stuff there for us just even to add to that list further uh you have eastern orthodoxy yeah thank you yeah. orthodoxy in general you have the uh the coptic church which is 2000 years old the ethiopian church which is 2000 years old uh, the Assyrian church, which is 2,000 years old, all these traditions across the board uh, that you mentioned and I just mentioned all hold that Christ's body and blood is truly present in the supper. Right. I mean, it's it's a, it's amazing thing when you see the, the consistency across the board on the right. interpretation of what Jesus meant in his words of institution. Yeah. Yeah, so this idea that... Um that it's just a, a symbol um it's it's an innovation of the church and whenever you find an innovation in the church you really want to you really want to question it and and i and i think it's a it's a good discussion to have well sam i want to ask you a question your friend mm -hmm. um do you think if if 
some of this opposition to understanding this is the real body of Christ. Is it maybe from an aversion to too Catholic, maybe? Yes, he is very anti-Catholic. Obviously, I am as well, but he is ardently anti-Catholic. He hates them. So I'm sure when I say um, that it's the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, he immediately thinks, yeah. no, <laughs> not, not going near it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, there, and there's a lot of um, baggage that comes with these these conversations and, and debates that, I mean, for me, it, it just boils down to letting God's word be God's word. One, one of the things I, I wanted to, one of the directions I want to go with this, uh, just briefly at least, is, you know, there's, um, uh, in, uh, uh, where is it, First Corinthians 11, verse 26, which is a huge chapter on the Lord's Supper, 10 and 11 both, but um Paul says this, uh, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So another thing that we're doing or that the Bible says about the Lord's Supper is that this is a faith um, that, that Christ is coming back. This is an anticipatory meal um, that that we're we're looking forward to his his return to judge the living and the dead, the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. And one of the beautiful ways that I picture this in the life of believers is when you lose a loved one um, who dies in the faith, you can be confident that they're communing at the same altar you are. Um, they're just on the eternal side of things where you're on this temporal side of things. Um, and and that's that's one of the things where where if we're just um, if we're just making this into a rational, understandable meal. It's it, it's it has no meaning. OK, you can remember the people who've died before but there's there's power in this meal that that's beyond our our record our our understanding no it's a he got me thinking about a bunch of things here um you know it's anticipate you know we're anticipating christ's return but, you know if you go back to the garden you know they had the tree of life you can eat and they would live at immortality from this tree of life mm -hmm. well of course we understand what happened at the fall but also when christ Came during his first advent, he became that tree of life as he was hung on a tree and blood and water gushed from his side. And we now, and why we're waiting on this side of glory, we're still partaking of that tree of life that, that we're waiting for for eternity when we are in the new heavens and the new earth, where again you have the trees and the leaves talked about in the sense of giving us immortality again. Or right. beating us in, in eternity. Yeah. I mean, you just see this constant uh, train of thought around this this tree and, and its body and blood and eating and partaking of. Yeah. I mean, we I know we talked about it a little bit, but it's even going back into the Passover itself. You know, they they slaughtered a lamb, they put the the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost, and then they ate the lamb. Right. The sacrifice itself. So. Yeah. It, it's always wrapped around we're believing these words given and shed for you, but there's also the, the, the bodily action of eating and eating the sacrifice along with it. Yeah. It's that pledge as Luther would call it, that the eating is really the, the pledge His body and blood is the pledge for us that, that your sins are forgiven. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, um, just kind of thinking along uh, the conversation that you're going to have, Sam, is one of the things that happens, I think, in non-sacramental churches is that when they say that they'll do baptism, but they'll it, it'll be a believer's baptism. Someone's decided to be baptized as an yeah. outward sign of an inward working, you know, and they'll they'll do the communion as a, a memorial meal. And one of the things that I think is interesting to to consider in those conversations is what is sacramental in their congregational use in their congregational setting? They, they may not use the word sacrament, but they will um, require and look for different events to take place, whether it's an altar call, whether it's um, uh, a, a, a feeling of the Holy Spirit, whether it's a, the sinner's prayer. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things that I think they, they, they've said, all right, these are not sacraments or we, we don't have sacraments in our church. But then they have these practices where they believe that something has happened between them and God that they look for and they, they value in their life. 
and and one of the interesting things about them is they're really not spoken of in scripture. They're they're not things that God has commanded us to do or attached a promise to. And, and so I, I think that's an interesting that might be an interesting tack to take in this conversation, argument, debate, whatever you want to call it, just to say is is how do you know God is working for you? And um chances are they'll just say, well, his word works and well, his word works in the Lord's Supper when he says, this is my body. His word works in baptism. When he says, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, those, exactly. those I, I think, are things that show up. No, it's interesting, too. You'll find out they won't call that uh, those on the evangelical side won't call it anything a sacrament. Mm -hmm. They'll call it an ordinance. Mm, yeah. Again, it goes back to that law aspect. This is something, it's the, the law side of the command, per se. Uh, the, you just do this in obedience to me right okay. yeah that's that's the only way they see this gotcha. and i would ask them this well, so what benefits do you get from god's word dad right uh, what, what benefits do you get from an ordinance mm -hmm. I, i'm curious to see what they would answer uh, i'm sure he'd come up with something like well it builds community in the church or it's just, okay. it's, it's, it's part of you know it's just something you do gotcha. to, to, to build community to make it more uh, professional something like that they, they would probably see understanding when we see the this is the body you know that the body blood of christ they would probably understand the body in a sense of the church as a whole yeah as a body it'd be interesting to ask well, what, what about the blood what does that mean what's that a metaphor right for hmm. yeah, yeah that, that seems to be his main argument is that well jesus speaks in metaphors all the time this is just another example of that but um yeah it's just a weak argument if it, it doesn't stand up yeah, interesting. So, how often should we have the Lord's Supper? You know, I it's uh, I think as often as you need it, which I think we need it all the time. Um, at a different church we here at the Concordia, we have it every other week. Some a lot of I know a growing movement within the LCMS is moving to a weekly communion. Uh, that's always been my, my preference as well. Uh, I, I think it's. You know, with our understanding of our worship service, the divine service, you know, we, we have the service of the word, and then we have the service of the sacrament. It's the two high points of our worship service where we are receiving what God promises yeah. to us. And uh, that's the ideal, but not every congregation is there for various different reasons. Uh, but I, I think as often as, as often as you need it, uh, much as possible. Yeah. So what, when shouldn't somebody take the Lord's Supper? Boy, uh, if they're living in an open, unrepentant, sinful life, uh, something they're not, they don't want to repent of, it's very public. Uh, I know that's always one criteria. Uh, sometimes um, if you're having doubts about what's happening in the supper, uh, if you're having doubts about who God is, period, uh, in a sense of it's not, I'm not talking about in the sense of, Lord, help, I believe, help, help my unbelief, but more of serious doubt. I don't think I believe this God anymore. I, I think. So at those times, you're saying you should take communion. Why is that? No, you shouldn't really. Oh, no, okay. I'm saying you shouldn't. No, uh, because it's beyond, it's a, it's a beyond an understanding of the gentleman there, the father there in Mark, where he says, I believe, help my unbelief. He still was believing and he was, he was. He understood the, the sinful aspect of his unbelief. Yeah. But I think when you get to a point where you say, I just don't think this Jesus is for me anymore. Right. Well, then you should refrain yourself from the supper as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's a, that's, that's a, that's a line that might be hard to discern. And right. Cause I, I, one of the things that I, I've been encouraged by personally, but also as a pastor encouraging others is that even if you have doubts, it doesn't disbar you from the Lord's Supper. But if you have denials, and that's where the line is, you know, if you have yeah. doubts, um, right. it's one thing. But if you deny things of God, then then you might want to refrain from and and prayerfully consider your your place before God, which quickly puts you back on the the doubt side instead of the denial side. So it's kind of a, a catch twenty two on some aspects, depending on what side of faith you're on. And so I, I think that's what it comes from. But but the Lord's Supper is for the strengthening of the faith. And so so if you're if you're struggling um, in your faith, if you're 
uh, struggling in your life, you should come to the Lord's Supper. But but yeah, like you said, there there are certain times when whether you're living in open unrepentant sin or whether you're um, in your mind, even in your heart, denying God's godness, um, those, those might be places where you don't want to eat and drink that damnation upon yourself. That Because that's what God's word says, um, that you want to examine yourself. And, um, and and I think the open, unrepentant sin probably deserves a little bit more treatment. That's when you um, you're doing something and you say it's not a sin or this sin doesn't matter or this sin isn't something I have to quit. And so so at those points, you 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 might be doing yourself more harm than good in coming to the Lord's table. But but um, those are conversations probably good to have with a pastor if if you're willing to, because that that could be very fruitful conversations for your spiritual well-being and your 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 spiritual health. I really like your uh, I like how you describe the difference between denials and doubt that distinction or that helps a lot uh i'm going to steal that from you <laughs> no and I, I think that's, no, that's great because uh, yeah and you brought up the story of the guy and is that mark eight or mark nine where the mark nine i think yeah yeah that's yeah. one of my favorite stories in the bible which a pastor's supposed to say about every story in the bible but he's this guy's just like he's at his wits end and he says i believe help my unbelief and it's such a great cry of faith that that god is ready to answer and, and loves to hear hear from the lips of his children because he knows our condition better than we do ourselves, and, and he knows we need that help. So he stands ready to give it. Yeah, Luther also uh, makes one more category of people, those who are unconscious. Mm. is someone else also that uh, shouldn't receive the supper just for the fact that they cannot discern anymore Yeah, with that. Yeah. Well, what, one last question for me, and then I'll see if you guys have anything else. So um, I'm going on vacation. You're my pastor, Pastor Mapus. I'm going on vacation. There's no Lutheran church within um, 100 miles, and I want to have communion while I'm on vacation. Can I go to the local Catholic church? They believe it's the real presence. Is it okay if I go there to have communion? Uh, what What would you say to me? I would say don't do it. Uh, just because, yeah, they might they might they have half the story in the sense of uh, we would understand of the real presence, but they don't share our full confession of faith as we gather around the altar. Uh, and we talked about in, in 1 Corinthians 10 about being that one body, that one loaf, that one mind. Uh, we're not of one mind with the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, especially when they see it as, you know, when they see the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice, a re-sacrifice of Christ, an unbloody sacrifice. Uh, we don't hold to that. You know, that's a work aspect that they've added to the supper. Yeah. You know, where we see it as the one time, the benefits of the one time sacrifice of Christ. They're re-sacrificing Christ on every altar. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that's you know, no. And it's, or it's just that you could go to visit the local Methodist church. Right. Uh, or, or, or no, I think, let's make this even better. Presbyterian church. They might understand that, you know, you receive the forgiveness of sins. But they don't believe that it's the real body and blood of Christ. Your, your spirit, you ascend spiritually up to where Christ is seated at the right hand because he's unable to be at every altar because he's also man. I mean, it goes back to that two natures of Christ thing. There again, I would not go. Uh, I would not. I would not eat to the Lord's Supper in those situations unless it was a Lutheran one, an LCMS that, that I'm in fellowship with. Right. Because yeah. of the public with the public witness of that part as well. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other aspect I would add to that to stepping out of the questioner to the answerer is is that a, a, such a person asking such a question is is in a good such a good frame of mind because they desire to receive the Lord's Supper. They desire to receive the gifts there. So um good on them for asking that question. But um it's I think it's um it's it's one thing to to want to receive the Lord's Supper as often as you can, but at 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 what would you have to be sacrificing in order to receive it in a place where you might not be in agreement with everybody? So so that that's something to weigh there. And so so when like a vacation situation, even longer term situations, you you might really have to carefully consider because um you you don't need to have the Lord's Supper on vacation and and I I would even be so bold as to say 
will go to the worship service, abstain from having the Lord's Supper and, and hear the word of God come to you there. Enjoy the Christian fellowship and and long for the day when we're all at the Lord's altar in, in eternity. Um, but but to receive the Lord's Supper is something that's a little bit more involved than just the passive hearing of the word. You're actually doing something that makes a statement about the um, confession you have and the confession um whether or not you agree with the confession of the church that you're there with. All right. Got one more question. I got a question for you. Sam, why I'm asking, think of a good one. This is your chance to get him live here. But, <laughs> but my question for you is now, what about if you're on vacation, you're somewhere a thousand miles away, you're in a year of emergency situation, the health crisis, you're in the hospital. What if you're in that situation and a Catholic priest comes in and offers you communion? What do you do? It's a life or death situation. Yeah, yeah, that that's that is a good question, and I I, I think it would still be the same answer, and I would lean more into part of that answer of you're not receiving the Lord's Supper does not place you out of God's hand, if if that makes sense. So yep. so the Roman Catholic priest comes to you and. Uh, apparently he's a bad Roman Catholic priest if he's offering you a Lutheran communion on your <laughs> deathbed, but um, but you're not receiving communion from him does not question the salvation of your soul. Um, so so I would say no. I would say that would be a, a no situation for me. Would did, did I get it right? Yeah, I think I think you're pretty good there. Yeah, no. you know you always you know, you know but then you always have those situations like with chaplaincy and wartime situations. Right. You know, where you're communing all kinds of people. Well, and, and there are, are times, too, like what, if somebody moves to a part of the country where there are no Lutheran churches and and at, at that point, it might be better for your conscience and better for the um, continual uh, nourishing of your soul to change the confession of your faith. And as a Lutheran pastor, that's hard for me to say, but but if there's a, a drought of, you know, confessional Lutheran or, you know, uh, similar or, you know, the, the teachings that you agree with it, in order to receive the Lord's gifts, it, it might be a, a different situation and, and not saying that's a, an open door to open fellowship with others. But but those situations, like you said, um, military chaplains, that's that's, you know, potentially even a different situation there. But but again, it, it comes back to are you saved or, or not? I mean, being a good black and white question and just because you're not receiving the lord's supper um at a certain point in your life doesn't mean your salvation is in question and, and i think it you, to to draw a line where you you should be concerned is if you stop desiring to have the lord's supper that's when you you might say well that's a red flag that's like when somebody says well i believe in god but i don't think i need to be baptized well god tells you to be baptized so it's not a uh a, a up to you thing it's you believe in god or you don't and so um, and, and these questions kind of bring into mind the uh, emergency baptism situations, you know, you know, because right. what if you're on vacation and you, your uh, family member has a child and the child's um, not going to make it? Do you, do you let the Roman Catholic priest baptize? Well, we actually have a um, even closer to home allowance that, that we say, well, anybody can do a baptism in this sake uh, in the case of an emergency. And so so baptism in the Lord's Supper being different though, because God has guarded us against unworthy reception of the Lord's Supper, whereas you can't really unworthily receive baptism unless you're um, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, which at that point, why would you want to be baptized? So, No, it's a great, uh, this, uh, what you just said, uh, I was going to let Sam read this, uh, Mueller's Christian Dogmatics, great book, uh, it's got some long Italian or Latin terms there, but, but it's not as bad as what you think, but he makes a great distinction there about the difference between, like, you know, we allow anybody to baptize in cases of emergency because baptism initiates grace, mm -hmm. whereas the Lord's Supper doesn't initiate grace but preserves. It, you know, we don't give communion to an infant to create faith. It's only those who can discern. Uh, but baptism is something that actually initiates grace and salvation. Right. And for, that's why we do have those slight differences in how we understand who can administer it, who can receive it uh, with, with the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Yep. Yeah. No. Sam, got any questions? 
Yes, this may have been answered earlier, but in his misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper, is my friend uh, Nate or anyone who doesn't see it as the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, would they fall under the definition of drinking damnation upon themselves? Oh, good question. <laughs> Ooh, that's heavy. <laughs> ah. Yeah, I, wow. What would you say, Pastor Mavis? Because I, I would say, you know, if you look at Paul's words in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, is it 1 Corinthians 10, if whoever eats or drinks without discerning the, the body and blood of Christ is, that's that's right in that verse there um yeah but but is is such a person in a state of damnation i i would say our god is bigger than that and more gracious than that and the the word is more effective than that and i would pray that they're hearing that effective word um for the sake of the forgiveness of their sins um so and, and ultimately, whenever it comes to a question of damnation, we we humans have a really good out of saying, well, I'm not God. <laughs> so it's not up to me to to say that. Yeah. Um, but but at the least, and this is a very important step, we should say this is a very questionable ground to be standing on. And so you don't want to be um, you shouldn't be comfortable in such a situation. Right. I, I, I'm with you. I think uh, not drinking damnation to themselves. But they are causing themselves spiritual harm mm -hmm. uh, uh, because they are turning something that meant to be pure gospel that they receive, mm -hmm. especially for their assurance of their salvation. Right. But then we're turning it into just an ordinance. It's something that they are commanded to do only. Right. And, and so where do you want now? Does Where does your friend now turn to have that concrete assurance that? His sins are forgiven. Right. And he, he always tells me, Sam, you're, uh, you're seeing, like, you see the uh, the sacrament as a false god. It's okay. a false god to you. And I can't stand that. And aside from that, I say, well, you're taking something that God has given you and, and you're pushing it away. Yeah. You're saying he didn't give that to you. So you're saying it's just a memorial. Right. You're, you're, you're rejecting that part of God that he's given you. Yeah. No, great question. That's, uh, and I still have to think about that. I, I think there's i think there's more harm there than probably than what we're thinking maybe it's taking place what that is i just don't know do i think it's damnation no because you're saved by grace through faith alone yeah um i think the the, the real harm i want to double back i think the harm is on the assurance side of things mm -hmm. uh with that yeah, yeah. no and that, and that is a um a good argument and i think a lot of it comes from perhaps our misarticulation and misunderstanding on those who we're talking to um, when we talk about baptism and the lord's supper because i've heard that um that before um that you're making baptism or the lord's supper into a, a false idol um but but when we have a, a proper understanding of it is you no know, we're just doing the things that god told us to do and we're believing these things do what God says they'll do. So, of course, they're important. Um, and so, yeah, we, we talk about baptism a lot, but it's not baptism itself. It's what baptism delivers to us. And that's the death and resurrection of Christ. And same thing with the, the, the Lord's Supper. It's not the, the Lord's Supper isn't the end all be all. But what happens there connects us to the end all be all. And so that's why it's so important to us and we value it. Um, but, yeah, that that's again, it's one of those you're you're in a different frame of mind about what the whole thing is and so it's i, I don't know if even um understanding those things um or, or people will listen to an explanation of those things whether yeah, yeah. I, I, I there's there's one more thought that comes to mind for me is um the difference between a sacramental and uh you called it ordinance kind of church but um I, i've got a diagram somewhere in my my teaching notes you know there's a difference between a sacramental view of the lord's supper and baptism and there's the ornamental view of the baptism and the lord's supper and so for for us god's here um we got the sacraments which give us everything we need from god and then for the the uh, non-sacramental churches they have god here and then they got themselves here. And then afterwards, they got these ornaments, these, okay, we'll do these now because we've received from God. 
these activities. Um, and so they ornament their life with the Lord's Supper. They'll do it, you know, probably at Easter and Christmas because it's a, a nice thing that, that God told us to do in remembrance is what they'll say. Um, rather than us, we, we see them as the, the channels by which God is brought, comes to us. So, Right. But there's a sense of pride there that we are what giving, we are what is giving the, uh, the sacrament power. Mm -hmm. That's how it's meaningless, but that's not the case. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, then I do got one more question for you, and I'll let you. <laughs> I'll allow it. Go ahead. When does it become the body and blood of Christ? Oh man, well, it's <laughs> when it's when Jesus says it is. <laughs> when he says it is, right? That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you you know the different views on that better than I do. I'm I'm a simple man. I just I just know God's doing what He said He's going to do there, but. There's a there's a view called receptionism, right? That yeah, someone yeah. who who believes appropriately receives Jesus' body and blood. Um, and then what's the other one? The consecrationist view. Um, consecrationist, when, yeah. cons, when it's consecrated on the altar, then it's Christ's body and blood. Um, and and I think if you had to push me, I, I think we fall into the consecrationist camp because we we yeah. treat it with respect. Um, and and that's one of the reasons why uh, we we want to make sure that. Um, this is part of the um, behind the scenes, you know, when we have the Lord's Supper, we don't put it away that we don't put the reliquy, the remains, the leftover Lord's Supper. We don't put it into a special box like our Roman Catholic friends and and um, hold it in the sanctuary for the week. We we um, we dispose of it properly and respectfully. And so we'll pour any leftover consecrated wine, blood of Christ into the ground. And, and similarly, um, we'll often take measures to make sure we don't over consecrate the host that is the bread that we receive um, but if there's any left we will either consume it or dispose of it in a, an appropriate respectful manner no that, that's a good way it's uh i always kind of liken it uh, i think most lcms pastors are lean towards the consecration side or just all out consecrations uh but at the same time you cannot uh, you cannot reject you can't have some sympathetic views towards the receptionist side uh, just for the fact is because if you don't, you're going to run into the heirs of the Roman Catholics who we'll put the reliquy of the leftovers into a tabernacle, will pray down the street, and everybody can bow towards it, and you can all kinds of errors can happen with that. Uh, I, I think that our Lutheran confessions really have a nice understanding of it. You got to have consecration, distribution, and reception. That is the sacrament, and don't ask any more questions. Right. And good. That sounds like I'm a good Lutheran then, because I, I just take it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we just know what we're supposed to do with it. And we know what God is doing in it. And um, we'll leave those details to the heavenly debate halls. You got it. Yeah. No, good discussion. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Sam, you got anything? I'm all good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. You guys rung me out, so I uh, I don't think I got anything left to say. Uh, if you got any questions about anything we said or you want to um, leave a comment, we'd love to hear it. And we'll uh, look forward to being back with you uh, with another topic before you know it. All right. Take care. God bless you guys. See you. Yeah, see you. Bye.